Hi guys, uh, we're going to continue with chapter one today. So last time we started chapter one and we went over some basics of evolution. We went over uh, some principles of Darwin. We went over a little bit of natural selection and we also went over the levels of organization. We also did that Alessi example. Uh, I added that just because it's something new in the world of science and pretty much it's, it's groundbreaking. So I wanted to make sure I give you guys some uh, good content there. But nevertheless, today we're going to go over the cell. We're not going to do all the organelles yet. I'll go through a few of them today, but I want to do the basics with knowing the difference between the two types of cells. And then we're going to get over some interact, go over some interactions between organisms. So to start off, we have two different cells. And I know you guys probably have learned this kind of stuff since, I don't know, probably seventh grade. Um, but there are two different types of cells. There's prokaryotic cells, there's eukaryotic cells. Your teacher might have said, okay, prokaryotic cells, they're pros at everything. They don't need a nucleus. They don't need organelles. And eukaryotic cells, they need a nucleus and they need uh, the organelles. So in eukaryotic cells, these are two main ones that we're going to go over, uh, animal cells and plant cells. So animal cells and plant cells are both eukaryotic, but they're, they're a little bit different. Both of them still have a nucleus. Both of them have organelles, but the organelles they have are just a little different between the two. So the plant cells are going to have chloroplasts and different, different organelles like that. But animal cells, they don't have them because animal cells, we don't go through photosynthesis. But at the same time, animal cells have some organelles that plant cells do not. Now, prokaryotic cells, they don't have any organelles. They don't have a nucleus. The only thing they have that kind of resembles an organelle is called a ribosome. And uh, the ribosomes are going to be used to make proteins. So ribosomes make proteins. And both eukaryotic cells and prokaryotic cells have ribosomes. Okay. So here is a picture of a eukaryotic cell and a prokaryotic cell. And I put this here just because I liked the picture where you can compare the size of them. So the big one here, obviously, that's your eukaryotic cell. We have our very large nucleus in the middle and it's gonna be full of DNA. And then around the outside, there's just some organelles, okay? The picture is meant to just compare prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. It doesn't go through all the individual organelles. And I liked it because we're not gonna go through all the individual organelles today. We're gonna to do that later. Uh, up top, we have our prokaryotic cell. They estimate it to be between 10 and 100, 100 times smaller than the eukaryotic cell. And you guys can see there's, there's all these brown and orange organelles in our eukaryotic cell and they are not in the prokaryotic cell. Now, you can see the purple area here, and I know it kind of looks like a nucleus, but it's not. It's actually just the DNA pretty much just chilling there in the middle of everything. Um, so the prokaryotic cell, the DNA is not enclosed in a nucleus. It's just chilling there in an area called the nucleoid, okay? Um, if I were to spell that out for you, just real quick, um, the nucleoid is spelled N-U-C-L-E-O-I, oops, and a D. So that's the nucleoid area. Sorry guys, my writing is not great. Um, but anyway, so that's the area that contains the DNA. Now here is, again, that same picture of the prokaryotic cell. It's just blown up just a little bit so you can uh, get a better picture of it. And like I said, it's very small. It's one uh, micrometer in size, which is, is very, very tiny. Okay, so just to talk about the DNA, whether it is prokaryotic or eukaryotic DNA, it's all the same DNA, okay? It's just, like I said, not housed in the nucleus in the prokaryotic cell. So DNA is, contains all of your genetic information. And what we're going to do at some times in our cells, we're going to condense that DNA into chromosomes. So chromosomes, they're like all those little X's you guys um, are probably familiar with in regular bio. So they're like this, okay? Um, that is what we call a chromosome. However, however, 
The DNA by itself, when it's not in chromosome form, kind of looks like just a bunch of mush. It's almost like a bowl of uh, spaghetti pasta that's just chilling there. And what happens is when we make it into a chromosome, this stuff, which if we were to unravel, would just be like really long lines like that. This uh, DNA actually is like looped around our chromosomes like that. So what we do is we kind of loop it like that and it forms this X looking structure. Okay, so there'd be like one big piece there. And then if I were to do another long string here, this long string would be around, you know, this guy here. And we would loop him all around forming this lovely X, all right, of our DNA. So anyway, that's kind of the difference between regular DNA and chromosomes. These are our chromosomes. And this DNA, which is not in chromosome form, it's still DNA, it's actually called chromatin. C-H-R, O, you guys are like, come on, you can write it. <laughs> A, chromatin, T, I, and an N at the end. Okay, so that's chromatin. Um, and that's our uncondensed DNA. That's our not chromosome form of DNA. And there's different types of chromatin, which we'll talk about in a later chapter. Okay. So here is our um, DNA, and it looks a little bit different here. What they did was they stained the DNA uh, under a fluorescent, or with a fluorescent uh, isotope. And this is actually the lung cell of a newt dividing. Now, what's going on here, guys, is right here we have one cell, and that DNA is being pulled apart and it's forming two cells over here, okay? So in order to form two cells, because we only have one over here, in order to get to two cells, we actually have to replicate our DNA and make a copy of our DNA so we have enough DNA so that our cells have the same amount of DNA as the original cell, okay? But that's a newt. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever seen a newt before. Disney was actually going to make a movie with newt um, it was going to be all about Newt, and they started making the images for it. And then a movie called Rio came out. I believe it was about a bird of something. And it was like the exact same storyline as the Disney movie. So they're like, oh, man. So they, they scrapped it and uh, made a different Pixar movie instead. But anyway, if you guys don't know what a Newt is, here's a quick video on the Newt. Hailing from the Pacific Northwest, the rough-skinned newt is one rough customer. Looking for tiny invertebrates, it has wandered out of its riverside territory and into the garter snakes. Mr. Climiot does not. The like newt snakes. seems unaware or unconcerned. Tiny glands in its skin are home to deadly bacteria. They produce tetrodotoxin a lethal poison that paralyzes the muscles, stopping the diaphragm and heart. Garter snakes, though, have evolved a tetrodotoxin tolerance. An arms race between snake and newt has led to higher and higher levels of both resistance and toxicity. To the point that the newt contains enough poison to kill a creature far larger than its normal predators, like a human. So the question becomes, which animal is further along in the race? The newt arches its back and displays its orange underbelly, a clear signal that it's not to be messed with. The garter snake decides it's not worth the risk. But the same cannot be said for all predators. The newt returns to its stream, only to encounter another threat. One closer on the family tree. A bullfrog. Bullfrogs are insatiable and indiscriminate. Oh, it swallows the newt whole. 
Inside the bullfrog's belly, it's a race between the stomach's acids and the newt's poison. The frog collapses and dies. The newt climbs out and is finally on the way home. <laughs> I love that video. Okay, so it, this kind of goes back to what we were talking about last time about the two organisms evolving together uh, with the hummingbird and the flower. The flower keeps putting the nectar down deeper in, but the hummingbird's beak keeps getting bigger. It's like the toxin of the newt with the venom of the snake and everything like that, um, you know, they're two evolving, so you never know who's going to live, the snake or the newt. It's just who's more evolved. But anyway, um, I thought that was a cool video on the newt. So um, if we read through this, guys, uh, and I'm not going to read it exactly, but if we go to the second bullet point, genes are the units of inheritance and transmit information from parents' offspring. Okay, so you are going to inherit your genes from your parents, all right? And this is going to direct how you develop and how you grow, if we look at that last bullet point. Now, moms, uh, you know, your mom, everyone has a mom, right? Um, so when your mom was forming you in the womb and you're developing, your mom actually gave you special genes that your dad didn't. All right, these are called maternal genes. And there's one really cool maternal gene called the bicoid gene. And what this bicoid gene does is make sure that you have a top and a bottom axis of your body. And we'll learn about this gene a little bit later in the year. But it makes sure that, hey, you have a head, literally. If you don't have the bicoid gene, you don't have a head. You don't have a top part of your body. Um, and we see this gene in different, different animals as well. So it's kind of cool that just one gene can influence the whole top of your body from forming. It's crazy how, uh, how many genes we have out there. So here is how everything starts. You guys know, okay, we have the sperm, we have the egg, they come together, all right? Um, and it's like a race. I mean, if you guys have ever seen videos of sperm and egg coming together, there are like millions of sperm just swimming and trying to get to this egg and trying to fertilize this egg, all right? Um, it's kind of crazy too that like different sperm swim at different rates. So we have obviously like male sperm and female sperm. Um, there's, females are XX for the chromosomes, males are XY. So all the eggs are gonna have an X and the sperm could either be an X or a Y. If it has an X, well, if an X fertilizes this egg, the, the child's going to be female. But if the Y sperm fertilizes the egg, it's going to have an XY uh, genotype. And then that XY means that the baby's going to be male. So more of the story, guys, females are XX, males are XY, and the dad actually determines what the sex of the baby will be. So sperm and egg come together, we get fertilization. After fertilization, the baby uh, is it one single solitary cell right now. So at that time, that one body cell is pretty much the baby. And that one body cell has to go through a whole bunch of cell reproduction, a whole bunch of mitosis in order for that baby to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And these are all stem cells right now, guys. They're all going to have their own function later on. And at after some time, we are going to take all this clump of stem cells. They're all gonna differentiate and we're gonna have a baby, okay? Kind of like that with arms, legs, what have you. So for DNA, to get back to DNA, um, we have for DNA two strands, all right? We're gonna have one chain on the one side and another chain on the other side. RNA, which is uh, the other form of nucleic acid that we have, RNA is only single-stranded most of the time in our bodies. There are some RNAs uh, that exist out there, but the, the RNA that we use mainly in our body is gonna be single-stranded, all right? 
Uh, your seventh grade teachers probably told you about the A, the T, the G, the C. Okay. So we have adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine, and these are your four nucleotides. Okay. So it's apple in the tree, car in the garage. What did Mr. Carmina just say? He said apple in the tree, car in the garage. What this means, guys, is uh, A is always going to bond to T. So if we have one chain here, okay, the A is always going to bond to, I'll draw the other chain a different color, uh, is always going to bond to the T of the other chain. Okay, and then we'll have a bond in between here linking our two chains of our DNA. Same thing, if we have a G on this side, it's always going to bond to a C on the other side. All right, and that's how it's always going to be. And this is our double-stranded DNA. We have one strand here, one strand here. If we had a T here, it'd be an A here. If we had a C here, we'd have a G on the other side. It's just the opposite, okay? Oops. All right. And here's a better picture of it, guys. I drew it straight because it's easier for you guys to visualize. But when DNA uh, bonds together, it actually twists. It looks like a spiral staircase. So all your... Sorry, A's and T's are going to be in the middle. All your G's and C's are going to be in the middle there. Okay, and then the outside is going to be the rungs of our ladder, which we will talk about later what's in there. So RNA, guys, is going to be our intermediate between DNA and making a protein. So what happens here is we go from when we are making a protein, we're going to go start at DNA. And DNA is in our nucleus, and DNA never leaves our nucleus. So if I want to draw a cell here, real quickly okay here is our nucleus in the middle that is where our DNA is right in our nucleus okay it never leaves the nucleus DNA never leaves the nucleus instead what it does what DNA does is it's going to take all of its A's its T's its G's its C's and it's going to transcribe them into a message and that message is going to be called RNA okay so the RNA is going to leave the nucleus. Think of it like this, guys. We have our DNA, and our DNA is very, very, very important to us. We never want our DNA to get hurt. So our DNA is never going to leave the nucleus. The nucleus is like, is like its little house, okay? And that house protects the DNA. So what we do is we take this, um, this message that DNA has, and we put it into RNA. The RNA leaves the nucleus, and then what happens is this RNA is going to get translated into our protein, okay? Now, the protein, what the protein is going to do is it's going to allow whatever message DNA was sending, that message, it's going to uh, allow it to be made into a protein, and that protein is able to use whatever the message is trying to convey, okay? So in other words, the DNA is like the message, but the RNA is the person that can actually put that message into effect. It can make different different things, okay? So this is called gene expression. We take our DNA, DNA leaves the nucleus, goes to RNA, all right? The, I'm sorry, RNA leaves the nucleus, and then the RNA is going to be made into a protein, all right? And that's where we can express our genes. So that's uh, DNA going to RNA. Another thing I want to mention about RNA, guys, is right now with everything going on in the world, which is crazy out there, um, we have some viruses out there. And the main one, COVID, right? That's our big one right now. COVID is actually an RNA virus. And the things about viruses are they're actually not living. Uh, they don't have, they're not a cell. All a virus is, is pretty much a package full of nucleic acid, whether it's DNA or RNA. So the, um, the problem with COVID, why it's so hard to, for us to treat is because it's RNA, kind of like AIDS. AIDS is also uh, an RNA virus, and it's hard to kill something that isn't living. But when that COVID gets in our bodies, uh, same thing with the picture I just, I just showed you guys, all right? If I, um, if I go back to it, this is COVID right here, the RNA. 
but our body's also making RNA, and that RNA is being made into a protein, that protein can do whatever job it is. When COVID comes into our body, our body actually thinks, okay, that's our RNA that's sent out by the DNA, and then what happens is our body starts making proteins based off of the COVID's RNA, not our RNA. And that's why we're having so many problems with trying to find a vaccine and everything for it, because it's very hard and very tricky to find um, cures for something that's one, not living, and two, that our body thinks is not foreign. It thinks it's part of us. So that's why it's so difficult. Okay, uh, human genome. So right now we pretty much have our human genome figured out. A bunch of scientists have been spending years trying to figure out the human genome. And we have everything pretty much mapped out. And our goal now is to be able to figure out what all these genes do. So we know the genes, we just don't know what every single one of them does for us. In other words, we have the DNA sequence, we just don't know what all the proteins do for those, those genes, okay? Um, and then last one, guys, this is just a definition. Genomics is a study of a set of genes within uh, in between species. A lot of these genes we have actually uh, carry on to different species and it's like the exact same codes for us compared to like snakes and different things like that. It doesn't even have to be something as close as monkeys to us. Reason being is at one time, you know, we were probably all uh, the same species if we go back far enough, you know, what, two billion years ago. And um, it's, it's just kind of crazy that we all shared the same DNA. And as we evolved, as we diverged, we started to, um, you know, change our DNA slightly, but it's still pretty common or pretty similar between our, our different species. All right. So this one, guys, uh, I'm not going to go over this one too much. Um, I'm only going to highlight that middle one there. Bioinformatics is the use of computer tools to store, organize, and analyze a huge volume of data. This is what they were using to try to figure out um, our whole human genome, all right? Because our human genome is gigantic. I know one of my college professors at one time said, if you were to take a piece of paper and do it like 12 point font in a Word document and do like a bunch of ATGCs, do the whole piece of paper, put it in a filing cabinet, uh, a three drawer filing cabinet, and then fill all three of those drawers up with these papers, with the 12 point font, the ATGCs, and then put that three uh, drawer filing cabinet on a football field and fill all 100 yards up of the football field with these filing cabinets. That's how big your genome is. So it took, you know, it, it would take a very long time before just like, okay, I found an A, I found a T. Instead, if we do a huge volume at one time, um, it would go a lot quicker. All right, so I know we talked about the first day, guys. There's different themes for AP Bio. Second one is we're going to talk about the transfer of energy. Um, pretty much the, the whole, I guess, living species thing on Earth started with being able to get energy and to use that energy and can, to convert that energy. And we started to have some photosynthetic organisms that can take sunlight and transform it into chemical usable energy. So these were our producers. And then after we had enough producers in the world, we were starting, we started to be able to have consumers. And those are ones that are going to pretty much either eat the producers or use what the, what byproducts the producers make. Okay. This one, guys, is it's kind of weird when you think about it because we have been recycling all of our elements since the beginning of time. We're not creating new elements in the world today. Instead, we're like just reusing them. So when you think about like the water cycle, which is kind of gross uh, to think about, but you go to the bathroom, you go pee or whatever, and that water goes somewhere, that water gets filtered and probably used again. Uh, or Better yet, it gets evaporated, goes up into the clouds, and then it comes down as rain. So yeah, filtered pee comes down as rain. Uh-huh, that's, that's very um, soothing, right? So, but anyway, uh, 
through the flow of all these elements and all these different things, we are going to enter it into our ecosystem as light, and then it's going to exit as heat, as it shows here, okay? And this is pretty simple, uh, self-explanatory, okay? So that's our energy flow from left to right. We enter as light. Some different chemical changes are going to happen, and then it uh, exits as heat, so it's exothermic, okay? All right. Almost there, guys. Okay, uh, I'm gonna skip down to the second one there. Both organisms and their environments are affected by the interactions between them. And for example, your book talks about a tree and it's able to take up water and different min minerals from the soil. And the tree we know releases oxygen into the air, which is good. That's a nice relationship between us uh, and the, the, the plants. And then the roots actually help when it says form soil, guys, don't think like the roots are down there spitting out soil. It doesn't work like that, no. Um, what happens is the roots actually help to replenish the carbon in the soil uh, to help, you know, all the soil actually stay as it is. Because soil, us, a lot of different things are actually made up of carbon. We are carbon beings. Um, this one, guys, is going to talk about symbiotic relationships between organisms and if you ever seen finding nemo at the beginning of it um after you know the tragedy that happens with uh you know all the babies like going away uh, marlin says to nemo as they're in the anemone you know make sure you you brush your anemone and he like takes some one of the things i think and, and brushes against it um, but what happens here, guys, is the clownfish actually have developed to live in the anemone, and the anemone does not sting the clownfish because the clownfish actually cleans the anemone. And if we had like a shrimp or something come by, the anemone will actually grab the shrimp, it'll shock it, and it'll eat the shrimp. So different interactions. Um, and that one, the organism obviously with the shrimp would be harmed, but with Nemo, Marlin, uh, in other words, the clownfish and the anemone, it's a symbiotic mutualism relationship because both of them are benefiting. And over time, guys, with that second bullet point, we are going to uh, have different interactions and they can cause us to evolve because if we evolve, then other organisms are going to evolve. And one mutation in like, let's say a producer could cause all the consumers to actually evolve just based on that one change. So here is a sea turtle and there's some fish on top of it. Now these fish are a little bit different. I'm gonna show you a video on this. Um, but these fish are a little different than the one I'm gonna show you in the video, mostly because they're on top of the sea turtle. And you'll see the difference in the video. I'm gonna show you real quick. There's just um, music to this one guys and like some little reading notes at the bottom. So. Uh, just so you know, it's it, no one talks in it. It's beautiful all over elevator music, right?
So, if you guys uh, read the stuff in the video as it was going on, it's... Let me get back to our PowerPoint here. It was kind of cool because they have a um, symbiotic relationship between them with the sea turtle and the remora fish. And if you notice the remora were underneath most of the time, um, they don't have a swim bladder, so it's hard for them to regulate their height in the water. Some animals have a swim bladder, and what happens is they empty the swim bladder whenever they want to go up, and then they fill their swim bladder with water when they want to go down. They just change their buoyancy, okay? But you guys can see that the interactions between um, the remora and the sea turtle are very symbiotic. The sea turtle gets nice and clean, the remora fish get a nice meal, okay? They do this with uh, sharks too, the remoras, okay? All right. So we're going to talk about a little bit more uh, evolution in the next thing, guys. But here is pretty much everything we've talked about so far with similar traits between descent from common ancestors. How, like, you know, if we looked at the Alessi and the two different skulls I showed you guys, they did have some uh, similarities between them, but they also had some differences. So if I go to... Oops, um, Oh, sorry, I forgot the slide, guys. So we're going to go over the difference between different elephants here, okay? So we're going to talk about the evolutionary process between elephants. Yeah, it's like, okay, elephants, yeah. There are actually different types of elephants. I'm not sure if you guys know this, but there's these ones and there's these ones. So this here, this is the Asian elephant. Obviously, they are in Asia, right? Uh, Pretty much right now, only the males have tusks. The females either don't have tusks at all or have very small tusks, all right? Why is that? Well, because of poaching, right? Um, the African elephants pretty much still all have tusks. So poaching is, is a little bit better in Africa. And you guys can see the difference between the ears, small ears on the Asian elephants, big ears on the African elephants. And the color's a little bit different too. These are more of a gray and they have actually, and these don't show it real well, but right between uh, the eyes, they have a pink hue to them right here, like pink spots, and the African elephants do not, okay? So if I wanted to look at this map here, if you look right here at Sri Lanka, okay? Um, obviously if it's Sri Lanka and that area, Here's Africa, here's Asia. If we're talking about Sri Lanka, what elephants do you think would be there? Well, obviously it'd be the Asian elephants because we're pretty close to Asia, but Sri Lanka is a small island and what happened was there was so much poaching on Sri Lanka. Now those elephants can't get back to the mainland Asia. There was so much poaching for the ivory tusks that any elephants that survived didn't have tusks. So Right here, the biodiversity for elephants on the Sri Lanka island actually don't contain tusks, and hardly any of the elephants now have tusks on there. All right, most of them are tuskless, okay? So it's kind of interesting how we actually impacted evolution there, how we took out that trait for the ivory tusks, and the only ones that survive are the ones without the tusks. Okay. Um, we are almost done, guys. We've got like three more slides left. Okay. Um, I'm just going to go over the different types. There's three different domains of life, and we're just going to compare them real quick, and then we're going to call it a day. So three different domains, and these are our broadest group of living organisms. It kind of be like, um, you know how we went over the, the broadest one, their least specific yesterday was the biosphere. So our least specific for organisms, there's three of them, three domains. Bacteria, Archaea, and Eukarya. So Eukarya is the only domain, Eukarya is the only domain that has a nucleus. Um, Archaea and Bacteria, they are both prokaryotic ones. And Eukarya, they're going to made up, be made up of three main kingdoms, plants, fungi, and animals. All right, And you guys know everything about them. I'm not going to go Spend time going over all that. Um, again, here's your three domains. There's your bacteria up there. Uh, 
most of them are going to be single cell they're all they're all like congregated together there is your archaea and here is your eukarya archaea can both be unicellular and multicellular and i'll go over an example of them here so where archaea live they live in very extreme environments they're able to survive um, in these these extreme environments if you guys have ever been to yellowstone national park i have not uh, if you have that's awesome but here is a small video of a hot spring and a geyser I found with Yellowstone. So there's your hot spring there. And there's an even larger hot spring. All right, I'm not gonna, like I said, I'm not gonna show you guys all that. But um, you guys can see that they're, they're very hot, they were steaming. And these are the areas that Archaea are able to live in. They're able to survive in these very uh, extreme environments. Okay, and I think that is it for the day, guys. We will stop here with our uh, Archaea. Have a good rest of your day.